morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining. At CIQ, we're focused on powering the next generation of software infrastructure, leveraging the capabilities of cloud, hyperscale, and HPC. From research to the enterprise, our customers rely on us for the ultimate Rocky Linux, Werewolf, and Aptainer support escalation. We provide deep development capabilities and solutions, all delivered in the collaborative spirit of open source. Good afternoon. Yep, you're still on mute. There you are. <laughs> I was making noises. Get off the mute. What's up? Happy February 1st. Oh my Happy goodness, it is. I know when I journal this morning, I was like, wait, what day is it? Like 2, 1, 24. This is awesome. Dude, awesome. Life is a wild, wild adventure and it's good to be here. Um, it's I'm pretty excited about this topic, dude. Me too. It's always good to have Greg on. It's Greg is the best, so let's definitely bring Greg on. Greg Sullivan. There he Hi. is. Oh, see, he's on mute too. See, we got mute. I'm Greg. <laughs> I'm a Greg. Maybe not the Greg, but I am a Greg. You are a Greg. This is accurate. So we're going to be talking about monitoring, specifically HPC monitoring with one of our newest and most wonderful products called Ascender. Um, but first, we want to tell you guys about a little giveaway that we're doing because hello, if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you, thank you, thank you. Make sure that you like and that you subscribe and that you share this with your friends so that they can see it and they can like and subscribe, not just because it's fun and I'm waving my hands around, but obviously what we do here is educational and we want you to be part of the, um, in the know of what's happening in the HPC and enterprise world and what CIQ is bringing to both worlds. Um, but we also have a giveaway coming up. So as we're getting closer and closer to a thousand subscribers on YouTube, which is very exciting. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of that. We're going to be giving away a backpack with Rocky Linux logo on it. Now, I, I was not told we were going to do this, but can we get a picture of that up? Like, is that possible? Maybe at some point, just like flash it in the middle of uh, Greg's talk about a sender. That's <laughs> that a good question. <laughs> Fun and cool. I mean, I can see one on my screen right now. There I'm is a picture. Find a way to just of open it. one here. Hold on. <laughs> it looks Maybe. really cool. I love, love backpacks. Like, I have had, share your screen. Who? It's got to be you, Zane. Uh, I'm looking to just get the image out. Hold on. Know, maybe if I can make it. If Keep I talking. I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it out in a second. Hold on. Okay. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Yeah. Cause I don't want to like share my wrong screen. That would be really embarrassing, but I'll try. I'll try. This is thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, wait, don't move that. Cause I'm going to share that one right there. Can I do share screen? Uh, shares in the last two. This is not very friendly. This is not a Zoom. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I got it. it. Hold on. All right, you do it. Do, 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 do. Can I sing? <laughs> can we stop you? I think it's the better. You thing. can. <laughs> <laughs> Take control, man. Take control. OK, so anyway, so I'll give you some details while we're figuring out how to show it to you. So what, there, there it is. Go. Rocky Linux backpack. That is there amazing. Okay. So when we reach a thousand subscribers on YouTube, so it's not the 1000th subscriber. So don't be going around trying to like subscribe and unsubscribe, trying to get like that perfect match. But when we reach that, we are going to um, go across our uh, social media platforms. So YouTube, Twitter. So make sure you follow us on Twitter as well. Um, what's the other one? Uh, LinkedIn. 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 Twitter, YouTube, and we're going to pick one lucky winner to win this amazing backpack. So again, thank you for being part of our like first little giveaway, which is super exciting, and also being part of our community. It's awesome. Okay. I think Excellent. That's all I have about that. I can stop sharing my screen. Thank you. So maybe you want to do an intro, Greg Soul, just for anyone who is not familiar with the magic of the this man uh sure sure so i am uh greg soul uh solutions engineer over here at ciq <clears throat> i've been in it for about 20 years as you could tell i 
have no more hair left, right? Um, so I compensate with the uh, the mustache, obviously. Sorry if my voice is a little rough today. I have the uh, the virus, which you're not supposed to mention on YouTube because the algorithm will do weird things. So <laughs> I'm pushing through. This is my second my second um, uh, webinar to do while uh, under duress, and we'll see we'll see how it goes. But um, yeah, 20 years in the industry, a lot of it heavy networking, whether it's like uh, doing ISP stuff or doing fixed based wireless, shooting internet to people all over the place. I've got to work with some amazing folks from all over from I helped light up some villages in Congo. I'm big in Nigeria, believe it or not, like Indonesia to right across the street. So, I mean, it doesn't have to always be far away, but um, uh, like most people in IT, I wear a lot of hats. So I've done a lot of different things. And uh, the last, I would say about four years, I've been doing automation. So Ansible based stuff for sure. And I, uh, I truly enjoy that. Thank you, Greg. I truly enjoy you being here as well. And as you're talking about like Ansible uh, and kind of working with that, talk to us about Ascender and just give us like a quick overview of CIQ's uh, rendition of that. I'm yeah, for that. sure. So Ascender, and this is an exciting time uh, to be uh, using Ascender because we have some really awesome stuff coming your way very soon. But we are built from the upstream AWX. We take it. We make it easy for you to consume. So we've written, I say we, it's the, the royal we, right? It's like all the smart people on the team have actually done the real work. I'm just the one who um, writes tutorials for it. So I get the credit, which I'm happy to take. Anyway, I digress. We've written <laughs> a lot of installers that make it really easy to grab and use both in just kind of uh, in a testing environment. I want to test really quick if I want to throw it in production, if I want to push it to a cloud provider. We've got a lot of installers that make that super simple for all of that. And, and honestly, if you're familiar with automation, you're familiar with Ansible, right? We create these little scripts you're going to run called playbooks, and it really tells the automation what to do. Well, Ascender puts enterprise controls around all of that, right? So that it's not just everybody running willy-nilly, firing from the hip Wild West. I mean, there's probably still some of that, but uh, it's going to crack down a little bit on it. And essentially, it provides an environment which you can run all of that, safely right most engineers are fired off their automation from a server everybody connects to the same server they launch it the problem is anybody connected to that server can run any of that automation right often referred to as unchecked automation i learned that one from ford uh, that little turn of phrase there and essentially what this means is with a sender i can say who gets to run my automation when where and what they operate against and i can even safely share it with other people that I don't necessarily trust in the environment, not to say I don't trust them, but you know, they're, I would say network and security are kind of diametrically opposed forces. You know, we're sort of the light side and the dark side fighting with each other. So I'm happy when uh, security just shares their automations and I don't have to have their draconian hammer crack down on me. Did I alienate enough uh, uh, security people yet? I'm trying, <laughs> to, I'm trying so. to get people to say <laughs> something in the comments. I feel like that. They've kind of come together, though. I feel like the network people don't want anybody touching their network either. So it's uh, you have security making it painful, and the network guys not want to open ports or yeah, create VLANs. It's always well, of fun, course. of course, because everybody's the smartest person, and and they all uh, they they all do it uh, the correct way as opposed to how everybody else wants them to do it. Obviously, and they do subnet math in their head, which is amazing to me. Well. I actually practice. So uh, like the uh, the octets I haven't memorized, I can say I'm forward and backwards, believe it or not. It's a special skill I have. <laughs> it just makes me nervous. Anyway. Slash 24. Does that help? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All I heard there was I'm the smartest person. No, absolutely not. You said it. <laughs> I didn't say it. You said, you said it. it. It's recorded. Yeah, All uh, y'all heard it. <laughs> no, no. There's uh, it's something I learned a long time ago. Somebody very smart and I respect a lot uh, told me you never want to be the smartest person in the room because then you have nothing to learn. So I enjoy being the dumb guy. I, I truly appreciate it. So I'm always uh, happy to learn from anybody around me if I can. But are you guys ready to learn a little bit about monitoring in the HPC space? Yes. Me too. 100%. I'm ready because I am not an HPC fella uh but uh i am dipping my toes in where i can and uh part of that was done via let me share my screen because i told you i used to be a network guy and what's a network guy without his diagrams and slides so i am learning a little bit more about how 
people go about monitoring stuff inside their HPC environment. Networking people, their NMS, network monitoring system, near and dear to our hearts. We couldn't live without it. Like, uh, I don't even know if they could go to the bathroom if they didn't have their NMS up and running. It's like they would just be completely lost. But in HPC, it's kind of a, it's an interesting world I've learned. And, uh, you know, it seems like code nowadays, or at least the code I write, tends to be a little bit sloppy, right? That it you don't have to squeeze every ounce out of it anymore. But there are some people that still need to be able to do that. And that is the HPC folks, right? Like even the, the smallest incremental um, processing saves, like actually equate to really big either time saves or dollar saves, which usually equate to the same thing, right? Same. Yes, usually. <laughs> so Hopefully. a lot of what they do is looking at how they tweak and tune something or Say they're moving to a new environment, they're running a new workload, and it doesn't seem to be performing quite right, or all of a sudden it starts performing differently. Well, how do they actually figure that out? Well, there's a set of tools that I've learned about called Performance Copilot, or PCP, that um, actually is one of the ways a lot of those folks do that. Um, so I was uh, in our Slack, was talking about how I was going to be experimenting with PCP uh over the weekend and they were saying well i guess greg's gonna get randomly drug tested but no it's <laughs> performance co-pilots it's a kind of a suite of tools that allow you to grab a bunch of performance metrics when i'm talking about metrics i'm talking about like uh cpu metrics right that could be utilize utilization wait time you're talking about memory stuff so memory utilization page faults cache hits your disk stuff right read and write throughput latency iops networking environment and that's a pretty straightforward one Environment could be temperature and power, which is interesting. People don't often think about correlations of uh, what's going on with kind of power or temperature. But I have seen in some environments degradation of service due to high temps, and you just don't realize that's you know a contributing factor. But then also like virtualization, so I hypervisor performance or reload resource allocation, right? So performance copilot will collect all this stuff. They have kind of their own set of tools that allow you to look at all of that which is great, but what I think is even more important is they allow you to archive that information, right? Usually for a set amount of time because it, it can get pretty bloated, right? If you store all of that. So it's one thing to have the ability to connect into a machine when there's an issue and to do some troubleshooting, but what happens if you don't realize there was an issue until two hours later? Well, this allows you to kind of go back in time and figure out what was happening in the moment to really kind of troubleshoot. So there are, I found a lot of different architectures associated with PCP and how you can use it. And this was kind of the simplest one that I found that I thought I would kind of automate. So in PCP, you have the concept of a collection host right here. It is really just any machine, any server that is running PCP to collect metrics on itself, right? That's considered a collection host. Nothing too crazy there. And most often you'll have your admin or you know, anybody that wants to check out that information, you're going to SSH into that host and you're going to run the PCP tools to see what's going on, right? Pretty straightforward. It works a treat. Well, you end up <clears throat> with your fleet of servers. Here you can see I have six. If I'm trying to troubleshoot an issue. Probably not that big a deal when I get to, I don't know, a hundred or a thousand. It's probably going to be pretty painful to connect into each one of these machines to pull metrics, right? It's It doesn't feel scalable to me. Now, it's not to say you shouldn't collect them on every individual host. I'm a big proponent of actually having them there if you want to be able to go back and kind of check that stuff out. But also, they introduced the concept of a monitoring host. Let's see if I can adjust that to be a little bit more in the middle. So a monitoring host is one that will either push or pull, or rather the collection host will push to, or the monitoring host will reach out and pull that collected information and it'll store it in one place, right? And so they suggest best practice. Your monitoring host only pulls a thousand hosts worth of stuff in there. Although I'm sure if you beefed up that monitoring host, you'd probably be okay. But essentially now your admin has one place to connect into to grab all this information. And PCP is more than just, uh, I'm running like PCP HTOP or whatever to kind of see what's going on. Uh, you can also like run Redis and Grafana and you can do kind of heat maps or graphs for all this information. You can also take this PCP collected info and send it off to a monitoring server, something like uh, I saw Prometheus have some plugins directly for pulling this information in. So you can start 
graphing it for long-term stuff, right? So that would be great for looking at um, scaling in the future, right? You're trying to figure out, I've got a new cluster coming in. This is what our workload looked like before. How do, you know, how much compute resources do we need? It's good for stuff like that, as well as doing triggered events, right? I see something anomalous. Let me trigger on this and alert in some way, right? Maybe a Slack message, maybe an email, maybe a ticket in the ticket system, something like that. Now, going back to the push or pull model, in my reading, um, if you have your collection host push that data, that technically puts additional load on them, which could skew your metrics, even though it's probably just a very small amount, like it depends on what you're trying to tune, right? So really the pull method is kind of the, the preferred method. Your monitoring host is going to uh, take a little bit more of a performance hit, but again, it doesn't really matter, right? If it takes it a little bit longer to, to pull the information from all of those hosts, it's probably going to be okay. And you can always just beef it up and you'll be fine there. So I went with the pull method, right? So keep in mind, collection hosts, anybody who's pulling metrics, the monitoring host, the one that's gonna grab all that info and kind of store it in one place. So I got a question for you, Greg, and it's probably a question for the audience too. When you were reading through that, did you find that people were doing that on the head node of a cluster or were they spinning up a VM somewhere else outside of the cluster? Where were they putting that monitoring? Yeah, I didn't see that specifically. But I, um, in most of the stuff I did see, people were putting it on just kind of a dedicated machine off to the, the I think it depends. Let me roll back. It depends. I think <clears throat> if you're getting to that point where you're really taxing that monitoring host, where it's, it's working hard and it's chugging and doing all that, you probably don't want to have any other critical applications running on there because you might affect its performance, right? So I would say keep that in mind. If, as you get closer to that 1000 mark or you're really starting to push the resources, on that monitoring host, you know, move it off to something on its side, or you know what, just bypass that all together and just start with it over on something, you know, some VM off to the side that's not going to affect any of your core functionality. I would say it's probably a, a good way of figuring out where to stick that monitoring host. Make sense? Absolutely. Now I'm just curious. I want to go to dig into how people are deploying this. <sighs> Looking for specific. <laughs> use cases and how people are utilizing this isn't always the easiest. Um, I'm not sure. I guess HPC guys don't think it's I mean, gals and folks and fellows and fellettes and everybody in between. Um, I like to tell people I'm from Texas. So guys to me means a group of people. There is no gender associated with that. But um, uh, I think uh, generally these folks just think it's not interesting. So they don't really publish like how they're utilizing all these things in their use cases. So I would love, and I've been asking for anybody who has feedback on how they actually use all these tools kind of specifically in their environment. Like one person telling me is great, but if I get like five or 10, uh, I get a better kind of more overall idea of, of how people really use all this stuff. So definitely give me some feedback. I'm friendly enough, not necessarily friendly, but I'm friendly enough. Friendly but enough. <laughs> for those of you, that aren't familiar with Ascender, this is it. So Ascender, while it is a nice, usable, clicky-click GUI, which you see here, um, there is more under the hood. And so one of my favorite parts, which I never thought I would say, uh, is the API that's baked into this thing, right? So enterprise controls, but now that we have an API, you've got all these existing tools in your environment that you know, trust, and love. Guess what? They get to take advantage of automation now, right? So if you're a ServiceNow shop, you can actually have it call in with say service catalog items, they'll call in and perform automations, or you can access the CMDB, the configuration management database. So like the list of all your hosts in your environment, you can pull all that into here and use it. You got a monitoring system. It can call the API to fire off automations if it sees something happen odd that it doesn't expect. So it really gives you the ability to start using this for more than just, I have to interface with the tool. I've got existing stuff. Now it gets to interface with the tool as well. Automated remediation. It's like magic. <laughs> it's the dream, right? Or as I like to say, yes. don't wake Greg up at three in the morning. Exactly. That's what I call that stuff. But I'm gonna I'm gonna consolidate this a little bit. And so in here we have job templates, which really is the place that ties all of your required components for automation into one. We have inventories, all the hosts I could potentially operate against, projects. That's we're pulling in my Git repository that has my playbooks. Remember my kind of recipe for how you're going to perform this automation credentials. How am I logging into the random hosts? And then the job template again, 
pulls all of that together in one place. And so I'm going to look for my PCP stuff here. I should have three entries. I have one that installs my collectors, right? So all of my collectors, it's going to run through. It's going to fire off all the required pieces for said collectors. And then I have one here for my monitors. So it's going to run through and it's going to build out the monitor hosts and all that stuff. And I've created something called a workflow just to call them one after another. So I could run them individually and that would work fine. Or I could use something like this called a workflow where I can take individual job templates in here, aka playbooks, and I can string them together in interesting ways. So I could here have uh, while it performed this and green means on success, go this direction. I could have actually added a plus and say, well, you know what? If that first instance fails for some reason, run this playbook instead, right? So you can see I can start branching and I can have multiple branches and I can have them converge back together. So it really allows you to start treating your playbooks, your automations like Lego bricks. So I tend to shrink down what I'm trying to do into like kind of little discrete things so that I can start reusing them in workflows really easily. This is my favorite way to share automations with people. So let me close that exit without saving. Don't break it, Greg, because you're about to launch it. And I will go ahead and click launch on that. Now, like, like I say, like any good cooking show, I've already performed this because this takes a little second to run to connect all my hosts. And so again, this is my monitor host. This is my collection host right here. So whenever you have your collection host, <clears throat> as soon as you get PCP installed, uh, if you want to test and make sure it's up and running, I can type PCP. It should show me uh, some information about uh, what's running on the system, kind of hardware wise. That tells me PCP actually installed. So I'm good in that respect. Now, something else that it does is it's going to configure this host to actually listen on port. What is it like 44321, I think? Exactly. And part of my automation is I actually tell it which monitoring hosts are allowed to connect in. So I basically set up an access list, right, to keep it a little bit more secure. So just not everybody can hammer those um, those listening ports, right? So all, the only the authenticated systems are allowed to uh, connect in. So as far as this guy goes, PCP is running. It's listening. Does it like the playbook is actually fairly simple. I can move over to my monitoring host and I could take a look at directory am i in var log pcp pm logger i actually set this up in my playbook as well my monitoring one and i can show you that in a minute if you're interested um, but essentially i'm saying where do i store all of the info i'm going to collect from all these different hosts where am i going to stick it i'm gonna stick it in this folder so do a ll i'm going to list the folders i can see greg rocky nine that's my uh collector over here so i'm just going to list the contents of greg rocky nine there you are i can see it's collecting collecting various statistical information in here i can see that it's actually getting pretty hefty and i installed it this morning at about i think it was about 10 o'clock and it's already getting pretty big on the file so i have these set up to store and they're kind of recommended as about 24 hours of historical information in here right because um it will get a little bit hefty and i mean you can always adjust that if you want to it's completely configurable but as you can see, it really was as simple as me clicking launch and it reached out and configured all those hosts and my monitors. Now, if I add one more host, I can still launch, rather launch the exact same automation. I don't have to specify, hey, run it just against this one host because the Ansible, excuse me, <clears throat> Ansible is item potent which means it will run. You see all these green OKs? That means I didn't actually need to make a change because I'd already run this on this host. So it was already pre-configured. So I can run this, say, for compliance to make sure everything's configured the way it is. If I update some of the settings, I can run it. And obviously, it'll make changes against everything. If I add one more host to my inventory, I'll run it. And only that one host will have the change lines in there. So it makes it really easy to rerun your automations without breaking things. So when I used to manually script stuff back in the day, it was a bad time if that script broke halfway through because if I tried to rerun it, probably wasn't going to turn out well for myself or anyone else involved or probably those around me. I was probably uh, it slightly double broke stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's a pretty cool function of uh, Ansible that I can rerun this stuff over and over. 
So that was that workflow. I can show you that exact same collector install from my previous run. You can see all these changed entries, right? That's where it's actually going through and configuring. I can rerun it over and over and over, and it's just going to say OK afterwards. So this stuff is not the most exciting thing I could potentially show you, um, but it actually is pretty useful. I'll pop into, say, the install playbook. Really, the only part you have to configure as a user is to tell it, here are the remote subnets you want to allow the monitoring host to connect into. After that, it's pretty much just going to go in, install PCP, configure all the, the files. It's going to update your firewall on your machine. It's going to update SE Linux, start the service, and that's it. So it really takes all the work out of it for you. If you want to do any customization, you can come in here directly. You can override those variables at runtime really makes it simple. In about five or six lines, you can configure that on a suite of 5,000 servers, right? Like genuinely like hands off and it'll just go, which is like kind of crazy to me. That's kind of mind blowing. It's very cool. Yeah. So for sure, any HPC folks using PCP, I would love to hear your war stories, how you actually utilize it your various scenarios. Um, this is kind of a generic configuration, right? I'm just taking most of the defaults in here. Like I'm curious what the vast majority of people do to like tweak and tune it and change all that stuff. If you would be interested in me adding, say to the monitoring host, like the, the Redis and Grafana piece, that's like two lines. I can add that. I'm just, I didn't know if anybody was interested in it. So I'd be curious if they are. So we did have one comment that was talking about uh, having issues around 70 to 80 nodes on a single host. So they have, that's where they kind of have their monitoring machine set up. It's around 70 to 80 nodes. Nice. Well, all the documentation I read said about a thousand. So that's good information. And I think real it world examples, in real world precisely. And I was thinking it probably also depends on how much information you're pulling, right? Because you can um, extend PCP for various other applications. So if you're running some of those other applications that have a whole lot of information that it's going to be collecting, I mean, it's it's going to it's going to skew that uh, collection uh, size very vastly, I would think. Real world. I love it. Me too. It's always fun. For sure. That was great, Greg. I, I, I'm. I too. Now I'm ready for feedback. I want to hear how people are using this thing. I want to see it in the real world. Mm, for sure. Or maybe it's inspired somebody to go turn it on that they haven't wanted to go to a thousand nodes and do it before. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty neat because you do have, what I think is neat about it is it emulates the regular command line things you're going to do to do, do your troubleshooting, right? Like kind of a, an in top, right? You could do PCP H top and it'll actually show you, kind of, it'll like pull it up like it's just the application and you're, you're walking around and, and doing stuff in there. But you can also, at the same time, export all that and then graph it, right? So you kind of get uh, the best of both worlds. You can still troubleshoot in the way you're accustomed to, but also have some long-term statistical graphs to go along with it, which I think is kind of unique. I'm not used to seeing that, which is pretty neat. You know, it's not like generally you can't go back in time and ping hosts from a router that's having problems, right? So it's like, you know, it's neat to be able to really see that stuff. I also like tying stuff into monitoring whenever it will go do something. Something's happening. It will trigger automation to go do that first line of defense, the things that you have to go do, and it can do it instantly instead of waiting for you to get to it for 15, 20 minutes. And mm. then when you get there, you don't have to log in. You just look at the data. So PCP it's does cool. have a binary in there that allows you to set up triggers. Uh, so you can watch the, the information, the metrics that it's collecting, and you can trigger and do events. Now, imagine you're doing that on a thousand hosts. You'd have to have that trigger configured for all a thousand, but maybe you do that on the monitor host, but you're still having to monitor, set up the app to do the trigger for all the things. So to me, that seems like it could get hairy pretty fast. Obviously, if you're using automation, I mean, you could automate the process, so it wouldn't be too bad. But I think a monitoring server pulling all of that would be the best tool for that. Like To me, it yeah. feels like that would be the best scenario. As long as you could get the same uh, level of granularity on what you're trying to match in there, I would think that would be the better place. At least that's my opinion from experience in the past. So is there like an environment that is either too small or too big for a sender type of automation? 
Uh, I don't think so. Um, automation. Well, I say I was going to say automation doesn't care how big your environment is. Um, as long as your automation can scale, it doesn't care how big your environment is, uh, which is a good point, Rose, because Cinder can scale. I mean, we've worked with people doing um, millions of hosts inside of Ascender environments, right? Like being able to really uh, get big and manage all that stuff. But uh, even down to, I don't know, an environment with 50 devices, it's still going to save you a ton of time. Like uh, I like to tell people a lot of my inroads were, or a lot of the customers I would talk to were networking customers. And one of the low hanging fruit for networking folks is updating the firmware on a device. That's 15 to 20 minutes of human time to do that. First, you have to upload it. You have to, you know, reboot the device. And then you start sweating when it doesn't come back when you think it should. And then eventually it comes up. You're like, oh my God, I was just about to get in my car and drive up there to make sure it was okay. <laughs> that has happened more than once to me. Uh, and it's happened in things in other states. Anyway, I digress. Um, but then after that, you have to do all of your checks, right? I have to test this stuff. And as a seasoned network engineer, of course, I know all the things to test. I have this big list that I could test, but I'm just going to do these three and then everything's okay uh, until eight o'clock hits and users start actually using stuff. And then I found out I missed something. Um, but the good part about automation is it's happy to do all of that. Um, and it's happy to test as much as you want without question. It will test all of it. It doesn't care and it will do it instantaneously, which to me is a major advantage over doing any of that stuff yourself. So not only can you uh, say you have 50 networking elements times 20 minutes a piece, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of human time you're wasting right there to do all that stuff, right? Say a zero day comes out, you need to update all that stuff now. You need to make a change window. You've got to scramble, do all that stuff, or I could just put it in my automation and let it safely do all of that. So it's huge, even for... A relatively small environment it also sets standards around how you're going to do everything you don't have uh we love saying snowflake there really aren't that many snowflakes out there but every engineer will do things slightly differently if you don't have kind of a template or a pattern for everybody to follow and if your automation is the one doing say network configuration it's doing system provisioning or package management on various things it really is going to be able to consistently do that in the same way for everybody so it uh, it's definitely a game changer. Now, does it take a little while for you to um, get accustomed to using automation? Absolutely, right? Everything does. You know, at one point you didn't know how to ride a bicycle, and guess what? It's you know, it's like an awesome mode of transportation once you get the <laughs> opportunity to really get in there and figure it out. Um, for people that uh, don't always have the time to dedicate to learning it. Uh, that's one thing that we're happy to help with is that we can come in and help get your automation off the ground, right? I'd like to say we get the airplane off the runway into the air. So we can help you build out your environment so that it will scale to whatever size you need to, right? We can help you engineer it as big as you need it to. We can also help you build some of the automations right off the bat, right? So you can have some templates to follow. So if you don't have a corporate standard on how this stuff looks, we can give you some stuff that will help you develop that corporate standard, but also some automations that save you a ton of time and we can teach you some best practices. So we can do all of those things. Happy to happy to do that. That's actually, um, while I enjoy doing these things, that's my, one of my favorite parts of the job is really getting there and getting my hands dirty and helping people kind of learn and, and grow and see those light bulb moments where they really start getting it. And just, you know, that, um, that genuinely uh, sparks joy. Is that is that still a, a phrase people say? Of course it is. <clears throat> I, 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 how can you not love that phrase? Sparking joy. Like who would not want joy sparked? I don't know. I mean, that sounds like something a pyromaniac would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as I'm thinking about automation, I mean, is it possible that there are people out there that have no automation tools whatsoever? Like, have you come across companies where you're like, what are you doing? This is insane. Okay. So that, that's yes. a piece of the question. And then the next piece is if there's someone who's like, yeah, that makes sense. I should do it, but I don't even really know where to start. Can you start with like, 
one thing that you automate and then build and build and build on there? <coughs> and Or do you really need to have the big vision, right? Like, do you need to know where you're going to start or can you just start? Those are really good questions. And believe it or not, I run into those questions from multiple five, Fortune 500 companies. Um, and Zane will attest, we've talked to a lot of Fortune 500 companies that are enormous and are in charge of some like life safety sort of stuff and they're not <laughs> using important. automation it's like how how do you guys keep your hands around all this stuff it's it's like to me it's like terrifying um but also i came from some environments but i used partially my personality but i came from environments with high slas you know and so uh i just operate on a different level of paranoia but yes there are some people that get pretty big and they're not using any automation so um they, you don't have to be you're never too small and you're never too big to start using automation. I mean, I think it's it's going to aid and assist um, always. Something I've noticed is companies tend to grow um, a lot of times through mergers and acquisitions. And oftentimes we're not getting additional bodies to help solve these problems. So we have to use automation, right? We have to start using tools to help us kind of grow. And, and most of the people I talk to have really good teams. Like they have really good IT teams full of smart people. And they just need extra help, you know, and they're going to be able to do that through kind of an automation tool. And I, I think to your point, Rose, um, the uh, the methodology I would always talk to people about is crawl, walk, run, right? You got to start somewhere. So whenever you're very first getting started, there's always some low hanging fruit. And that is to collect information about your systems that are out there. Nobody has all their infrastructure documented. I have never once ever talked to a customer. And that's not to say people don't do a good job, but nobody ever has it completely documented because oftentimes it's a somewhat manual process. And if it's manual, it's at the whims or time or availability of a human. And, you know, so it's like, what are you going to do? So one of the things most people will start with is information collection, right? It's safe. I'm not going to break anything. I'm not going to hurt anything. I'm just going to go and pull a bunch of information from my host. Well, once you collect all of that, you can learn to start doing very discrete changes, which means I'm going to change one small thing, right? And I'll, I'll do it safely and I'll make sure I feel good about it. And we've seen, we've literally seen it with virtually every customer I've talked to, right? You, you just start small. It's the safety, you know, until you get comfortable, you kind of ease your way into it. You'll do a discrete change and then you'll widen the scope of that change. You'll get bigger and bigger. And then eventually you'll start defining what portions of your infrastructure look like in code. So in my Git repository, whether it is a, uh, a server or a networking element, I'll define how it needs to be configured in code. I'll have the automation take that and then push it to that device, to that hypervisor, to that cloud, to whatever it is. So now if I need to make a modification, I never actually touch that device. I just do it from the code, which is like, Again, it's another one of those learn to ride a bike because that's also kind of like a mentally scary thing, you know, and have this automation maintain all of your infrastructure. But whenever you do a DR drill, holy cow, will you be a believer when well, you can stand up an entire set of infrastructure with just a couple clicks? Because I've seen people where they are required for compliance reasons to test their DR plans, right? Disaster recovery. How do I recover if something catastrophic happens in my environment? And I've seen people where it takes them two weeks to do that. And I don't know too many businesses that can really sustain a two week hit on their systems being down. Obviously, that wouldn't be all of their infrastructure. Parts would start coming back up. But still, that's crazy. Um, and through automation, you know, you can turn it into a handful of hours. And part of those hours are humans feeling good about what's going on and humans testing some extra steps. Right. So. I think the automation piece can certainly uh, be a game changer in any environment, no matter what you're trying to do or where. I love watching this go through cab. Whenever people start getting to their change advisory boards, somebody started automating something. And then at the end of it, cab is asking first thing, did you automate this? Is this automated? <laughs> it starts eliminating problems and tickets. Uh, it, it's fun to watch everybody get jealous of everybody else who's automated and they start working <laughs> together. It's just fun. Or I've talked to um, some teams and what they do is every month they'll get together and they'll look at all the tickets that came through, you know, whatever their platform of choice is for like their team. And they'll look at what did we get the most tickets on? All right, let's automate the top one or two things this month. 
and the next month they do the next and the next, the next, right? So it's like they're slowly getting the most problematic things and making them just go away, which is incredible. Like <laughs> I haven't met very many IT folks um, that got into IT so that they could push the same. I mean, it's not George Jetson where you just show up to work and you push the exact same button for eight hours a day. They want to be challenged in new ways. They want to uh, architect. They want to try and engineer so new solutions. They want to research the new thing. They don't want to just sit there and keep the lights on all the day, you like run on the hamster wheel. So the automation absolutely allows them to do that. Hmm. I'm very passionate about this stuff. I don't know. Yeah, if you, no, no, it's I know. awesome. Thank I get you. super jazzed about it. You explain it so well, but I, I, I imagine is one of the issues of security team kind of looking at this and being concerned about there being one platform that kind of touches everything. Hmm. Hmm. Rose, oh, <laughs> you're kicking in my PTSD. Yes, <clears throat> we've uh, we've talked to many, um, many security teams, and I think at some point there always uh, we said there always has to be a password zero, right? Like at some point, some system is going to have to have like a password stored on it, right? And so it's generally your automation system. It's going to be able to connect into all of your infrastructure to maintain it. And, but even then we've seen people limit the blast radius. So in dev, they'll have like an ascender install in dev that only touches dev stuff. Right. And then over in test, they have one for test and product or uh, they have a clean side in a dirty side. Right. And so the dirty side will have its own automation. The clean side will have its own and the clean side can reach to the dirty and pull, but not somebody's first. It's like, there's, so there's many, many, many ways to, to stack this stuff up, but essentially, if you want an organization to run today and in the future, you're going to have to utilize automation. So at some point, your security team is going to have to come to terms with the fact that machines like software will be touching and managing the systems inside the infrastructure. And it's it's what do they call it in, in a negotiation, a real one? Everybody's unhappy. So <laughs> there'll be there'll be compromises, obviously. One there way is or the no win win. <laughs> but. Um, I can't think of a single instance where we talked to a security team that was um, feeling hinky about it and we couldn't help them feel better or come to a consensus that this was a good idea. Yeah, but absolutely, they will they will have problems with it. Um, there's mitigating things you can do is one is to protect it inside your network behind firewalls and you you know you just can't get to it from the internet and then say you do two factor authentication on it which Ascender supports, right? So you can do uh, 2FA. Um, but ultimately, you'll schedule automations to run in there and you have to trust that the system can run on scheduled intervals and reach out without human intervention to trigger that event. Right? You have to, you have to, when you're teaching your kid to ride the bike, at some point you got to let them go and they pedal on their own. You know, you got you to gotta trust and believe. Right, but you also put a tracker under their skin right here as well. Is that is that what you do? Well, <laughs> also everything that happens inside of a sender can be um, logged and right. shipped off for logging. And Jimmy's putting in some awesome work in the ledger, and he's putting in some stuff that it's going to blow folks' minds. Like I talk about excited. I cannot wait to start stealing his credit for that when I get to show it to everyone. It is going to be sensational. Like it is. Legitimately, people will be excited about this. They'll say, finally. So I, I can't yes. wait to really start showing showing that off. But I essentially, so Sorry, pulling information, making it usable for folks. Like security as well, but system-wise. I'm sorry, Zane, I interrupted you. Buddy. No, I was, that, that's what's going to be exciting for the security team is they may not like the fact that people are touching things, but when you show them what information they can get without having to go ask and what policies they can enforce without having to guess, did it get done? Did it not get done? Like They can just go do it. So it's going to be very exciting. Yeah. yeah. And then get a clean report back. Like on a schedule that whatever they pick every yes. minute, every day, every month, whatever it they will, want. It will just show up to them and they don't have to ask anybody for it. That that lowers the friction so much. That Everybody right loves there. that. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Okay. Do we have any um questions from the world? Questions? I don't think so. I haven't seen any on this side. 
Okay. Yeah. I don't see any on this side as well. Well, we do get questions that actually come into um, the website. So feel free guys to go to our website, CIQ.com. Anytime that you type anything in there, that message is going to go to me. I will grab Greg or Zane or Jimmy or any one of the team that can really answer in detail the questions that you um, have put out there. Uh, and we are happy to help. Please put Greg to work. Okay. Put <laughs> him to work. <laughs> right? yeah. Get him off of these webinars. If I can tag on to that, I am always looking for people's suggestions on, hey, demo this, hey, demo that. Like, I would love to see this, or how do you do that with automation? Because I only know what I know, and I'm not exactly sure what you're doing in your environment. So if you've got something really interesting, or um, you're just curious how something works, even if it's basic, like I want to make a demo on it. So send us as much feedback as you can comment on YouTube or yeah, I think it's info at CIQ, whatever, mm -hmm. get a hold of us. Let us know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Dickerson 87 feels like the rent theme song needs to be remade for security automation reports. <laughs> can you, can you do it, Dane? Can you, no. can you, can you nope. it? <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> not even gonna try no nope. all right but i like it i like it a lot Thank i thought you, you were in the singing mood today rose what happened no. <laughs> you, rose you know, might be. i actually don't know it so i would have to google it but we're live so like i don't know if i like pause i'll be back in a second <laughs> we'll i'll get it we're in good. my brain well we did 10 minutes to pull up a, a backpack earlier i mean what's what's another sure, couple? We did take 10 minutes <laughs> to pull up the backpack. okay so reminder you guys <laughs> Uh, on YouTube, thank you so much for liking and subscribing. When we get to a thousand subscribers on YouTube, we are going to randomly pick a lucky winner to win a backpack that's got a Rocky Linux logo on it. It is an awesome black backpack with the cool little, you know, circle mountain Rocky Linux logo. We are very excited to give that away. We are very um, uh, grateful for your uh, you know, community and for you guys watching and showing up and, and Greg mentioned a lot of the videos. So we, we bring him on here live to do these kind of demos, but he does his own, uh, where he is demoing different things to do with Ascender. So there's lots of videos inside of this channel of the CIQ, um, YouTube channel. So go check that out. If Ascender is of interest to you and you can leave a comment in, on any one of those or reach out to us on our website. If you have something specific, I know there's, um, there's a couple of specifics that I'll pass on to you, Greg, as well of people that have, have written in. Okay. So yeah, definitely. Uh, we also have a Twitter, we have a podcast, Flops and Threads. We are on YouTube, we are in LinkedIn. We love you, we want you, we need you. Uh, definitely reach out to us and thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Same time, same Thank place. you, Greg. Yeah, Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Greg. Bye, everybody. Bye.